Hi, it's Connor Svensson here, founder and CEO of Web3 Labs. This is a conversation I had with Ben Edgington, ETH2 researcher and product owner for Teku at Consensus. Ben comes from a very technical background, having started his career working on supercomputers at Hitachi, where he worked for two decades before he got sucked into the blockchain vortex and joined Consensus in 2017. In our conversation, we cover a lot of ground on Ethereum and its transition off proof of work to proof of stake, which is something he's very involved in and has seen firsthand how it's evolved during the, the past three years. Ben's a very well-known figure in the ETH2 community, and if you have an interest in keeping up with this fast-moving space, I highly recommend you check out his newsletter, What's New in ETH2, which is available at eth2.news. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Hey, Ben, it's great great to have you here. Connor, it's wonderful to appear on your podcast. I've enjoyed listening to a few episodes, and uh, yeah, I'm amazed to be here. Well, thank you. And uh, you, you've you know, start, started to do a fair bit of podcasting yourself as well in the, the, the last uh, year, I guess. Yeah, we had this thing going with uh, Coindesk, which was nice. We had about a nine-month uh, run, but then my uh, co-host... Uh, moved on from Coindesk and uh, we didn't pick it up again. So, you know, if there's a podcast slot open, <laughs> I would gladly fill it. Yeah. So this was, uh, yeah, that was a good experience. Enjoyed doing that. I'll tell you what though, Connor, it's exhausting having to have an opinion on every topic. Mm. I'm usually kind of like, yeah, whatever for, for most things. But, uh, you know, if you've got to appear and talk about something, you need an opinion. So uh, I found that... Um, you know, prepping for the podcast week by week and uh, trying to work out what do I really think about this was quite an interesting process. Yeah, ab absolutely. And uh, I mean, one thing though, no doubt you do have like a very significant opinion on, uh, or at least awareness of, um, uh, is, is the E2 ecosystem. But rewinding before that, you were at uh, Hitachi for Hitachi, sorry, for just shy of 20 years uh, until roughly four, well, just four years ago and um what was it that made you jump from that world into blockchain because you've, you've gone really really deep in terms of what you've been doing and we'll of course get onto that you know a bit more detail shortly but uh you know it's like you, you, you've worked in this very large corporate for so many years uh, there mm -hmm. must have been something you know pretty exciting that really <laughs> you know, sucked you in yeah yeah that's uh, right down the rabbit hole now um so I started my time at Hitachi um, doing very technical things. I spent about eight years working on supercomputers, doing very low level optimizations, as well as parallelization of code and lots of kind of computer science-y type of things. So I'd come out of academia to do that. Um, Hitachi pulled out of the supercomputer business in Europe and um, I kind of fell into generic techie sort of role doing all sorts of things like data center infrastructure and cooling. I worked on IPv6 routers for a while, um, biometric stuff, bunch of fintech security, just uh, loads of random things. And, you know, as is the way sort of drifted into management um, and then ended up sort of moderately senior. So um, my job title was head of engineering for one division of Hitachi Europe. Uh, and we were mostly doing fintech stuff, so mostly working with banks in the city of London and across Europe, um, biometrics and other um, security software. And yeah, it was a kind of quiet life, really. Um, could quite happily have driven my desk for another 10 years and retired, you know, uh, yeah. retired well. Around the beginning of 2016, uh, all the sort of uh, salespeople were coming back and... Um, and reporting, yeah, all our clients want to talk about is something called blockchain. Can you can you find out what it is? Um, they were talking to the banks, and it was hot, hot, hot at that at that time. Uh, so I I did a bit of digging, came across Bitcoin. Um, I thought interesting, but not that interesting. Um, read up on Ethereum and was just blown away. I just yeah, this this caught captured me. It was you know it entranced me. Um, and just started spending evenings, weekends, every spare hour, just uh, reading everything on Ethereum, learning everything about Ethereum, uh, hacking around with smart contracts, and just generally learning, you know, reading the yellow paper and learning from the the, the bottom up. Um, and uh, yeah, eventually I got the opportunity to to make that a full-time job. Um, I realized I was 
bored of management it wasn't for me i needed that what excited me was doing the hands-on techie stuff um and in the day job just didn't give me that that opportunity anymore so uh, that's um yeah so four years ago as you say uh, i joined uh, consensus and no regrets it's been an incredible journey yeah, and so, so much has happened in that time it, going going back to ethereum specifically though what would you say was the thing that pulled you in was it the technology or the community or combination of both because there was you know, they they were the first second generation blockchain but i think you know from my own personal perspective i've always saw Lin, uh, the parallels with the ethereum community is the linux community but without the benevolent dictator uh, but I'd, I'd love to hear hear you know your thoughts there yeah um community is super important and i i made my first sort of tentative steps you know a couple of prs to the solidity compiler and they were so nice to me um and so welcoming that i immediately felt you know part of the that world and that was great um technology uh, was fascinating i what i liked about it was it was all about computing in a resource constrained environment uh, which is what i've done on supercomputers you don't think of supercomputers as resource constrained yeah, but it but it is if you can speed up your code by 10 percent, you can save you know a couple of million dollars of hardware and so there's a lot of pressure to make them perform really fast um so all the same things about memory constraints and you know micro optimizations were happening on the evm but you know what what really captured me was the drama um and i you know i was getting interested in this through the dow hack thing i mean the dow itself was fascinating and then the hack and you know the 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 adventure that that was um and the drama around it just kind of hooked me completely um and, and dragged me in so it's a combination uh, of all of that and i still it is a bit like living in a soap opera sometimes um but uh, yeah, it keeps me engaged. Um, it's it's great. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember going along to a um, Ethereum meetup uh, back in Sydney a few, a few. I think it was a few weeks, literally, before like the DAO hack happened, and uh, the person there was talking about how you know this incredible thing's been written in so few lines of code, and it's basically like an automated investment vehicle. And yeah, we know what happened then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I never invested in the DAO basically because I didn't really get it. I just I like to understand what I'm uh, getting involved with. Um, I don't like to ape into things to my detriment. It turns out, but uh, um, but yeah, I dodged a bullet on that one. But yeah, it was it was fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so certainly with the, uh, the the NFT market now as well. I'm just, uh... Yeah, that definitely doesn't make too much sense there either in certain respects, but there's some people who really do get it out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fascinating how it's all evolved over the past four years. I reckon that when I first got interested in Ethereum, you could pretty much keep up with everything that was happening by spending a couple of hours a day on Reddit. Um, and then you were across almost everything that was going on. Nowadays, it's it's impossible, completely impossible to keep up. There's DeFi, there's NFTs, there's a whole host of stuff at the um, protocol level, which, you know, I, I, I try and, that, that's my niche to try and document some of that. Um, and never mind all the other chains, the roll-ups, the side chains, and everything happening there. Um, and then you've got the regulatory stuff, and, you know, it just goes on and on. So, um yeah, one of the things I've had to do over the past few years rather rapidly is kind of close down my areas of interest. I used to try and know everything, and now I know a lot about very little. But that very little is very significant, uh, as, you know, given, given everything that's happening with Ethereum. And uh, I don't know if, it, if it's not really correct to call it uh, you know, the transition to E2, so to speak. Uh, I guess it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole merge as it's being referred to. But you, um, when you started at Consensus, you were within the, the protocols division. And then you, you, I think it was roughly a year after you started there, you started um, well, you began putting out uh, what's new in ETH2, which was like a newsletter. And as you said, there was so much information and it was so hard to keep up with it all, even back then. You just wanted to start you know, sharing some of what you were, what was happening in the wider community. So um, when did you start working on, you know, move across to that sort of ETH2 bits? Mm -hmm. um, so it was obviously before you started writing the newsletter. 
Yeah, it's interesting sort of history. So I landed in Pegasus, which is a protocol engineering group of uh, consensus. It was quite small at the time. I was about number 12 or 13 through the door. Uh, we're now um, 70 plus people. Um, and I first started working um, on enterprise Ethereum stuff because, you know, with the corporate background and the fintech clients, that kind of made sense. But it just felt too much like doing what I was doing before. Um, yeah. And it wasn't the passion that had driven me in, it, which was much more about the open, permissionless um, mainnet world. So I, uh, with the permission of Pegasus, which was uh, very generous, I moved over to really to kind of pioneer Pegasus's um, mainnet work um, there. Uh, at the time, Consensus had no relationship with the Ethereum Foundation for sort of historical reasons. And somehow I found myself on a call with Joe Lubin and Vitalik. I think it might have been just the three of us somewhere in January 17 or December 16, uh, December 17 or January 18, somewhere around there. And Vitalik was saying, OK, um, we need some help. We need some protocol uh, research. Um, and uh, and it just feel, felt really right, really opportune. So I, from then on, I devoted myself to sort of building Pegasus R&D, um, built it up from a couple of people up to uh, 20 plus now. Uh, and a lot of that work was around um, Ethereum protocol research, mainnet stuff, as well as some, some enterprise stuff. Um, so a year into that, yeah, there's, did various workshops. There was a, a workshop in Taipei on sharding, which was great. And then uh, we sort of sco scoped out what Ethereum 2 would look like in July in Berlin of 2018. And late that year around September, October time, I kicked off the project, which became known as Teku, which is our Ethereum 2 client. Uh, and it was a research project at that time. We, we didn't have a goal to make it a mainnet production client. It was really part of our, our um, being involved in Ethereum protocol research uh, and having a seat at the table, we, we were writing the code. So I managed to get a team together. Joe was a great help in moving people around. And uh, uh, that uh, that was um, worked out really well. Uh, and we, we built this thing. Um, and after about a year, so we're up to late 2019, we sort of looked at what was there and thought, actually, you know, this, this is OK. Um, this has got promise. Um, it's more than... A, a prototype or a, or a research project. This has got potential to become a, a mainnet client. Uh, so we did a big, we have a decision-making process um, in Pegasus called SPADE. I can't remember what it stands for, but it involves a lot of consultation with, with just about everybody. Uh, so we did an exercise. Um, Rob Dawson, who's now CTO in Consensus, led that and we, we gave it the green light. We gave Teku. Um, it was called Artemis at the time. Um, we had to change that for the usual uh, tedious um, reasons, yeah. but <laughs> it's now now Teku. And we transitioned that to product development. Um, so we're now a product team and I'm, I'm um, product manager for, for Teku, which is a, a mainnet ETH2 client or beacon chain client or consensus client, whatever terminology you, you prefer to use. In terms of like how the space has evolved as well, there. I mean, certainly, you know, originally with this whole migration with Ethereum, going from proof of work to proof of stake, it was viewed as being a number of uh, phases that need to happen. With phase zero being the beacon chain launch, which happened last December, uh, and then this this notion of sharding, and then the actual you know application level layer cutover, so to speak. But that's that's all got sort of ripped up in the last mm. twelve months, and uh, so I, I, I get presumably um you, you, you there's there's well no doubt there's a lot of uh, specifics into why that happened that you could tell the listeners about why there was such a you know sudden change there and you know, why mm. we're on the trajectory we are now one of the things i enjoy doing is stepping back a bit and sort of comparing the world i'm in now with the world that i was in when i was working for a massive japanese multinational corporate um and the the different ways in which things get done and you know Hitachi accomplished a lot um, and uh, no, no criticism of, of the way they do things but how things are done in ETH2 world or Ethereum world is is very different um, very bottom up um, it is a lot of cat herding we have the Ethereum cat herders and uh, 
Um, we're reliant a lot on people coming up with new ideas, coming into the ecosystem, bringing ideas, taking leadership without necessarily having leadership conferred on them. Um, and there isn't the sort of hierarchical top-down um, structure. You know, Vitalik will come up with some ideas and he'll throw them out there and then it's up to people to pick them up or not pick them up um, uh, and, and things like that. So it, it, it is it's the cathedral and the bazaar model, which I've written about a, a few times. This is Eric Raymond's kind of classic essay on open source development. And, and we're fully in the bazaar and it's noisy and it's chaotic, um, but yet somehow really incredible work emerges from it as it as it becomes ordered and um, uh, order emerges from chaos. So yeah, it's fair to say that the the next generation of Ethereum, the the future of Ethereum roadmap has had a few pivots over the last couple of years, um, partly because new technologies and new things come to light. So so two things which kind of deflected us from the older roadmap. So we had a phase zero, phase one, phase two roadmap where we would deliver the beacon chain, which we did, uh, and then we would deliver data sharding, and then we would deliver executable shards, ex execution environments. And after that, we would turn off proof of work and move migrate Ethereum 1 over to Ethereum 2, a sort of multi-year project. This, this got truncated, so we delivered phase zero, and now we're doing proof of stake straight away. This is the next thing we're doing. And after that, we're doing data shards, and then we're sort of basically have delivered the roadmap. And a couple of things changed that. One was the emergence of rollups as a technology, layer two technology on Ethereum. So they give us a lot of what executable shards would have given us. They, they take out of the protocol layer, the management of state and the management of execution. They just rely on the protocol for data. So the on-chain you have the data, off-chain you have the execution and the state management. And, and that solves a lot of problems for, for Ethereum. Um, we can store data on chain okay, especially when we've got lots of shards. It was the state management and the and the execution that were expensive. So this, this roll-up ecosystem that's emerging, um, yeah, makes um, makes a lot of uh, important parts somebody else's problem, which is which is nice from a protocol developer's point of view. We can simplify the the base protocol, and then. Um, it facilitates an ecosystem where people can run many, many experiments and have you can have many different types of rollups and some will succeed, some will fail. Uh, and you can try and iterate many different solutions, just stuff we cannot do at the protocol layer. We have to be really, really conservative at the protocol level. Um, we, it, it's impossible to break anything. We, we mustn't do it. So, uh, so that's been a, a, a big breakthrough. The other one was um, my colleague in Consensus R&D, Mikhail Kalinin, um, just envis envisioned what we're calling the merge now, which is we take the Ethereum proof of work engine, so the ETH1 clients that everyone's familiar with, like Geth or Besu, um, and we basically just turn off proof of work in them and plug in proof of stake. We already have proof of stake running in the form of the beacon chain. Uh, and um, Mikhail envisaged a very straightforward way to do this. And so this has become the plan. And the pressures were on, right? I mean, um, the narrative around proof of work is getting increasingly sort of toxic. Um, this thing about NFTs are destroying the planet and burning down the rainforests and things. And um, yeah, it's about time we deliver proof of stake. It's been too long. Absolutely. And, and just, just to kind of go into some more details as well about those two specific areas, like the roll-ups um, versus the shards, for instance, there's, you have a number of different networks that have been emerging, these kind of, um, these, you know, what's more broadly being described as these layer two networks for Ethereum, you know, Polygon being uh, you know, the most popular one, but there being you know, a number of others. Um, where I think it's, it's, in, in your mind, and certainly you hear um, Vitalik mentioned this too, I think it's uh, zero knowledge rollups are kind of the preferred technology mm. for scaling. Um, but they're, is it fair to say they're not quite at a point yet where they're you know, readily available? And so hence, a lot of the layer two technologies that exist right now aren't quite um, you know, fulfilling that more utopian vision of where it's going to get to, but we're not too far off. Mm. Yeah, I have a 
a kind of layperson's knowledge of this stuff because uh, as I mentioned earlier I've had to focus and roll up some of the things which are sort of adjacent to what I focus on but not 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 core though I, I I think I have some intuition for for how it goes and there are basically two paradigms one of which is called optimistic roll-ups they rely on something called um called fraud proofs to um uh remain secure so anyone can challenge the execution on the chain if the roll-up operator um does something which is incorrect then you can challenge that with a fraud proof and there's a sort of crypto economic mechanism to reward correct fraud proofs and punish you know bad ones and so on and punish bad operators uh zk roll-ups have a sort of validity proof thing going on whereby they post proofs to the chain that they acted correctly and the, and the proofs are very easy to verify um and this is this is a much smoother a much more effective uh, way to to operate um with the optimistic roll-ups there are things like you can have a a, a week-long withdrawal delay if you want to get your funds out your nfts out um, to give people the opportunity to generate the fraud proofs and make sure they can get on chain without being censored, whereas the ZK rollups um, that don't have this issue. As you alluded to, this zero knowledge cryptography, and it's not the ZK part that's actually used, it's the succinct um, part of it, but that's getting a bit technical. Um, this, this cryptography is very new. It's really being built in the last couple of years and is uh, developing you know just super fast there's this cambrian explosion of different techniques to 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 apply it um and yeah it's far from being mature yet the evm which is ethereum's virtual machine the engine that, that runs stuff is not designed to play nicely with zero knowledge proofs and the snarks and the starks which we have so you know if you want to compile your solidity program and run it on a um on a zk roll up um this this has a lot of complexity and overhead be behind the scenes and people are working on that um and there are domain specific languages like um you know cairo and zinc which allow you to write directly in kind of zero knowledge specific languages but this is also new connor um and is really rapidly evolving it's 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 hard to know quite where we are or where we're going to be in a year's time um but from a technical point of view the zk stuff has the most promise it's the most scalable um and it's the most efficient uh, of the technologies out there as far as i can see and then um when we talk about the convergence with the merge with the, the eth1 mm -hmm. and eth2 um clients how how will that kind of pan out longer term because nearer term you you have your various different uh, clients to take who and base who say in consensus mm -hmm. is the case for um with the the i guess um pre proof of stake and proof of work networks and trying to avoid using eth1 eth2 and um, you don't you, you don't have to worry about that with yeah. me connor i'm i'm okay. wedded to uh, i i publish um uh, what's new in eth2 i mean you yeah. know i own the website eth2.news i mean you know this is uh, um i i'm fighting to preserve this te technology okay. <laughs> it's a uh, terminology <laughs> do, do you think that there'll be uh, it, it will make sense for you know longer term these the, kind of the clients to merge into one because coming at it from a very simplistic and you know probably naive mm. perspective it's yeah ultimately it's like the consensus mechanism that's being you know replaced uh with you know, with, with with the merge and uh you know is is that too simplistic of a view of this or do you mm. think that's feasible longer term yeah, it's definitely feasible. And it's something we're thinking about in, in Pegasus. So the initial design is you can choose any of the available ETH1 clients, as in execution clients. So that might be Geth or Besu or Nethermind or Eragon. Um, and you can pair it with any of the uh, available ETH2 clients or consensus clients, which is you know, uh, Teku, Prism, or um, Lighthouse or Nimbus. Uh, currently, um, the Lodestar is doing good. Uh, and they can um, combined act as the joint Ethereum 2 client. So um, they're well encapsulated. We've defined an API by which they speak to each other. 
but of course you're, you're getting two components from different sources they've got different stacks they've got um different documentation different metrics different uh, uh logging uh, everything so we're in the happy position in consensus of having both an eth1 and an eth2 client so we have basu and teku they're both java they're both apache 2 um and so we're exploring what it might look like to not exactly unify, but perhaps bring them closer together so that if you want to run an uh, Ethereum 2 client or a future Ethereum client post-merge, you can just deploy this one thing and it's all in one package with consistent documentation and consistent metrics and it's it's all there. Um, with, with Teku, our target users are primarily institutional, the professionals. Um, the, the the power users who are hosting thousands of, of stakes. Um, that's our sort of user persona as we um, you know plan our um, product strategy. Uh, and so thinking through from from their point of view, you know they can dual source their stuff. They can take Geth and Prism and run them together. But you know if it goes wrong, then who do they go to? Who do they shout at? Who do they point the finger at? Uh, this is always a classic issue in sort of um, uh, purchasing, you know, having um, uh, accountability for the thing. So we're thinking we might not get much technical advantage from combining the, the, the two clients, but there might be a, a nice point where you've just got a single source. And so if it goes wrong, you can just come to Pegasus, we'll, we'll, we'll fix it. You don't have to worry about which bit has gone wrong um uh, and stuff like that so I, I think there's not so much technical advantage but i think there's some nice usability and marketing advantages to sort of combining combining the two so we're, we're definitely looking at it but it, it's not going to be for a while yeah absolutely and so go, going a bit further into the whole topic of the merge you've just got back from greece recently oh yeah you can tell by the tan yeah. we, we spent <laughs> we spent 16 hours a day in a windowless basement <laughs> which was a shame but um yeah yeah um we got basically dev teams from um most of the clients eth1 and eth2 side and from the ethereum foundation and um a couple of consensus r d teams uh, we all got together in an undisclosed location in Greece and um, spent the week basically building a merge test net. So what this means is getting the ETH1 clients represented there and the ETH2 clients uh, in all the combinations I previously mentioned, working on a, a, a single test net and running Ethereum on, on proof of stake or simulated proof of stake. Um, it's the first time we'd, we'd done anything quite at that scale we'd had a sort of hackathon earlier in the year where we'd done an early version of this but this this was a huge uh, leap forward and um, we reckon we saved about three months of remote work by getting together in, in one place and you know after two years of not leaving my my house it was uh, kind of uh, kind of nice to get together with people again yeah i hadn't flown anywhere for 2 years which is unheard of in the last like 25 years so <laughs> that was, uh, that was kind of weird yeah yeah so it was a great success um we set some milestones um you know fairly easy ones just you know, uh yeah first milestone pass all the spec tests second milestone you know run uh your client with one other client so if you're running an eth2 client run it with one of the eth1 clients um and vice versa and then we milestone three is kind of run combinations so you've got multiple clients on the same network and then i can't remember four but five was run a test net with basically all possible combinations uh and keep it running for several days um so we did that and uh yeah it was it was great really good experience and pre previously of course there's been times where the where client teams have got together but i think Presumably, it's the scale though of it this time around was different because you had both ETH one and ETH two as well as uh, some you know researchers around it. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but previously it was more you'd have ETH two focused teams working together, say. And yeah, yeah, these things have been developed pretty much in parallel. Um, so the Beacon Chain and these sort of ETH two plans have, until quite recently, been done um, quite distant from the 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 historic ethereum network stuff so until a couple of months ago this uh, ethereum 2 or ethereum on proof of stake just hadn't even been discussed at the regular all core devs call um and we 
we started this beacon chain uh, almost a year ago, now running proof of stake and so on, but it, it is in parallel to the main Ethereum network. And, and the two sides, you know, the, the traditional Ethereum one developers and ETH two people really didn't have much point, point of contact. Uh, that's all changed. And this, this workshop we did was the sort of tangible, the, the uh, practical um, evidence of the change. But uh, you, we were also getting the proof of stake, the merge discussed on recent uh, all core devs calls. And now uh, everyone has agreed from all of the client teams, ETH1, ETH2, this is the next thing we're doing. We're not going to do any other upgrades to Ethereum before we deliver this, this merge, this proof of stake um, Ethereum. And in terms of the, of course, the, the the question that everyone's asking is around when that's going to happen. And previously, as in, you know, I think six months ago or so, the speculation was towards year end this year, maybe <laughs> Q1 next year. Is there a sort of you know feeling from the community on, on that at the moment? Uh, within this year was always over optimistic. Um, the yeah, timing is very slippery in this space, Connor, and I'm I'm very hesitant to say anything. Uh, definite just because nobody is in control of it right and if everything goes perfectly smoothly um, and yeah there are no hitches and all the governance is is happy and there's nobody in the community say you know waving a red flag then um, you know maybe um, towards end of q1 beginning of q2 but realistically um, it never goes as smoothly as you hope and we are a community of optimists. We wouldn't be doing this. Uh, we wouldn't be aiming to change the world if we weren't optimists. Uh, sometimes it kind of feeds over into our timing estimates. So I'm hesitant to put a, um, uh, a definite date on it, but uh, I would be extremely disappointed if we didn't deliver in 2022. And I'd be a bit disappointed if we didn't deliver in our first half of 22. So that that's pretty much as specific as I'm prepared to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's... Uh... <laughs> It's, it's, it's certainly exciting times, and especially seeing the two communities really working together. And like you say, mm. there's there's not going to be any other big changes until this happens. Yeah, no, no doubt that's going to incentivize a lot of people to, to make it happen in as timely and but safe manner as, as possible. Mm. So, so say if uh, you know we catch up again uh, you know, a, a year from now and the merge has happened, I mean, what, what's next? What's going to be next for you? Is it, are you going to be you know, deep looking at sharding or are you going to be starting to switch your focus somewhere else? Because you know, you, you've been so focused on this for so long now. Oh, personally. I mean, yeah, the, the ETH2 effort rolls on. I mean, so there are plans to um, do a post-merge cleanup, which will enable withdrawals. So currently you put down a stake you don't know when you're going to get it back. Um, we haven't, you know, nobody can actually take their earnings out of the beacon chain yet. So we need to enable that. Uh, that'll come a few months after the merge. Uh, then sharding is the next big thing, which gives massive scalability. And then there's a whole bunch of other exciting stuff. So, you know, there's a whole career to to be had um, being involved uh, in that. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I, yeah, I've got no um, particular expectation. There's a certain amount of internal encouragement within consensus to sort of pick up again the um, the sort of um, management um, corporate side of things. You know, I've got 20 years of it under my belt. Um, so getting involved in the more sort of corporate level stuff, especially as consensus is becoming a um, looking more like a traditional software company is attracting some serious investment and um you know, is is becoming a big player. Honestly speaking, between you and me, I hope nobody's listening. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not overly excited by that. So I'm, you know, uh, lesson learned. The, the the techie stuff is is where my heart is. So I'll probably find something um, like that to to uh, uh, fill my time. But it's but it's also like a, I think a classic problem um, in terms of as career technologists, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with with regards to being able to remain hands on, but also grow within organisations. Uh, I think the, you almost see this this classic thing where if someone starts off as a developer, they become a mid level developer, senior developer, then maybe a lead developer, and then it's management and management and management and management. And it, you know, if you're very lucky, you end up in a, a place where 
uh, you, you have that. And I, I remember work, working uh, for an investment bank a number of years ago. We were in a fortunate position for a time where we had managing directors who were still coding, but that was you know really an exception to the norm. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, as, as you say, though, there's, I think there's, there's so many people, you know, like yourselves, like people who, you know, work in my company as well, who really want to stay very hands on, but you do feel a lot of the time that um, organizations as they grow, they often you know, have that classic problem where mm-hmm. they're, the, the opportunity to continue to be hands-on and this isn't a, you know of course it's re- reflecting it on consensus but it's just more you know an, an observation about the technology mm-hmm. industry more generally um, and so I think it's really important that we can find ways to champion you know p- people to have you know careers like you know like like you're doing now where you've, you've come in and um, you've got all of this significant experience but also very you know significant breadth of technology technological experience um, and you want to you want to see people have um, I, th- I think it's important for the technology community to have more people to look up to like that mm. yeah it's a classic dilemma isn't it and you know I don't have any great answers I'm I'm very thankful for consensus um you know facilitating me over the last few years um largely i've you know carved out my own path and have been allowed to do so which has been um been terrific i i don't think in more traditional organizations you don't necessarily get the opportunity to do that um there's been a huge amount of support uh and you know i i think other people are are, are finding that as well we have a lot a high degree of autonomy within the company um and yeah i've learned to to really value that um yeah i i, I don't have answers to the, the questions of what do you do with elderly technologists <laughs> but, but uh, what i am convinced is that people are most productive about uh, when they are excited about what they work on and you know i tried to get excited about management stuff making powerpoints and things but ultimately it didn't it, you know, it didn't get me out of bed in the morning. Whereas, um, you know, uh, things that I do now um, motivate me enormously. Yeah, and you can completely see that when it's moving at you know, such a rate. And as, as you mentioned earlier on, the, the the whole ecosystem has grown so much uh, in the in the in the last while. And do do yeah, on on reflection as well. Do do you think that you know what's happening right now in terms of blockchain if we were going back um probably really the last five years of activity and we know that you know for the next five to ten it's going to be you know equally as transformative people certainly have parallels with the growth of blockchain adoption like it's growing at double the rate that the internet um grew at in terms of you know user adoption but do, do, do you feel that there were other moments kind of um in the last say 20 30 years where you, you think there's been other you know many other pivotal technologies beyond the internet and um you know crypto and blockchain or do you think it's kind of you know because i often hear people talk about how you know this is like a once in a generation thing that's happening right now but i'd love to hear what you think on that statement yeah it does feel like it doesn't it i mean i sat on the sidelines during the um dot com uh boom i you know i was working at itachi at, at the time and my colleagues were all off going, joining crazy startups and having, you know, the, the time of their life. And I was very risk averse and watched it all, all happen from the sidelines. And part of my thinking was when this blockchain thing started to look like a paradigm shift, um, I, I don't want to miss out again. This is my last chance. I'm, I'm not going to sit and watch it all happen. I'm, you know, um, you know no, no, nobody died during the dot-com boom. Everyone survived. They all, you know, they might have had a wild ride but uh you know everyone you know was, was was fine so risk is low just dive in um i i don't know about other technologies you know ai machine learning uh things like this are quietly changing the world um you know the mobile devices the whole um thing just inconceivable when i kind of started my career that you know i could wander around with the the world in my hands access to the world's information do video calls on my phone you know just astonishing and and these these kind of revolutions are happening all all the time around us but i don't know what it is about blockchain that feels like a paradigm shift um this sort of web3 narrative is really interesting um the internet of value rather than the internet of information you know lots of sort of memes uh, around that and um 
yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how it shakes out. And in five years, 10 years time, what impact will we have actually made on the world? Um, you know, there's a lot of noise and hype at the moment, but seeing what actually lands is is going to be going to be really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just what, what, one, one other question on that. Uh, if, if you weren't working in protocols, which which area do you think uh, <laughs> would you, you'd, you know, interest you most or captivates you most? Uh, within blockchain stuff yeah <laughs> i uh, so i initially interviewed for consensus diligence to be a smart contract auditor um pegasus grabbed me um which was fine and uh i don't know whether i would have been a good auditor or not but uh i do love that level of detail and the so the way i like to understand things and, and how i kind of ended up doing what i'm doing now is i i understand stuff from the bottom up you know, I need to know about the bits and the bytes, about the, the the machine code and the executions and the the packets on the wire and build up from there. I'm not a person who can look at an app and then dissect it and, and go down the stack. Um, and that's why I have a you know I have trouble with kind of modern computer science where you know they they graduate and they don't even know what hexadecimal is. And I'm like really, um, and so. Um, that lends itself to the protocol work that, that I'm doing now and also to the kind of smart contract auditing side because it's very, very detailed or you really have to know what's going on under the hood. You can't make any assumptions. So yeah, that I, I don't think I would be a DeFi DGN or an you know, uh, NFT artist or any, any of that, but uh, um, that, that would have been a decent uh, path as well. Yeah, either way, you'd be, you'd be one of the key people making sure it all works and is secure. So that's uh, yeah, <laughs> certainly very, very important place in, in, in those worlds um so if if people want to going to connect with you and really keep up with what you're doing of course you've got ETH, the eth2 news um but what's what's the best way for people to reach out or find you yeah eth2.news so i write every two weeks on uh what's uh what's new in eth2 that's that's the title uh so it's just a roundup of what's um uh, going on most fairly technical but uh occasionally i let let an opinion um hang loose <laughs> in there um and i've been doing that for three years or so um you can find me on twitter i am benjaminian underscore xyz don't ask and uh yeah twitter's a, a decent place to contact me if uh, anyone wants to uh, um get in touch well wonderful well ben it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today i look forward to catching up again soon yeah, great fun uh, talking, Connor. I mean, there's so much that we, we could cover, but uh, appreciate it. Uh, thank you for considering me an innovator. I'm, I'm proud to join, join the ranks of uh, the others that you, you, you've spoken to and, and, and humbled as well. But uh, yeah, good conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.